Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the host and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have problems with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios East and West, transmitting across the internet, this is episode 190 of Registry Matters. Hey guys, different show format this week. We were on T Jump's debate channel. T Jump is a philosopher where he hosts debates about morality and critical thinking. You can find him over at youtube.com slash tjump. You will be able to find the, the whole raw video where, uh, where we debated him. Not debate. We uh, had a conversation with him. He wasn't an opponent of ours. He just uh, he provided us a platform, and we were discussing the morality of the registry. And uh, so I'm releasing to you here the first part of it with maybe one or two questions that went on. It, uh, it kind of got a little crazy after that. But if you want to catch all of that, certainly go over to the YouTube channel there and give him a look up. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Have a great night. All right. It looks like we are live. So, Larry and Andy, thanks for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and your program before we get started? Sure. Uh, let's see. I guess uh, the easy answer would be that I approach Larry. Larry is an expert. Uh, about policy, and this isn't just about the the sex offender registry. He's an expert about policy from all aspects. If you want a traffic light in your neighborhood, he's the guy that will help you get it moved through the legislature so that you end up with a traffic light. Anyway, so I approached him about doing a podcast, and he asked me, what's a podcast? And uh, we then built out a program so that on a weekly basis, we would cover issues revolving around the registry either like as a first person or a second person or a third person, I guess I should say degrees, first degree, second degree moving out. Maybe there's a criminal justice thing that if we would change that, it would impact people that are affected by the registry. And so for almost 200 episodes now, which is a 200 weeks or so given uh, some breaks for uh, vacation and whatnot, uh, we have been releasing weekly episodes talking about court cases, uh, people that have terrible minor, minor infractions, and then they get locked up for an infinity number of years and just how really disgusting and overbearing it is that people end up on this, uh, what's called the sex offender registry. Cool. So you guys started a podcast about the sex offender registry and what is, do you have a link or something people can find you? Uh, of course. Search website. Uh, registry matters is the name of the program and it's registry matters.co. Same pretty much everywhere. YouTube channel is there, uh, but the you can find all the links at the website, which is registrymatters.co. Don't ask how it ended Ooh. up as a CO, not a COM. It's a long story. So I had not researched anything about the sex offender registry until you contacted me, until we talked back in Georgia X number of months ago. Yeah. Uh, and you sent me a lot of really good information on our Word doc with a bunch of question and answer thingies. Would you mind telling us about the information or the research you've done on the topic and why the sex offender registry is bad in your perspective. Larry, why don't you go over the history of where the AWA and the Jacob Wetter Act come from? Sure. The the sex offender registry, the modern sex offender registry was uh, developed in the largely the 1990s. The state of California had uh, enacted a registry in 1947, but the large, the larger scheme of things, the states uh, came around to the sex offender registry in the 1990s at the at the behest of the United States Congress when they passed the Jacob Wetterling Act in response to the disappearing uh, abduction and disappearing of Jacob Wetterling, who was missing for many many years, and they they encouraged the states to develop means of registering and tracking those who had committed offenses against children. So that is the origin of the modern sex offender registry. It's been changed many, many times through the in the intervening years since the 1994 when the Jacob Wetterling Act passed, and we now have something that resembles nothing like a registration scheme, but more like a punishment scheme. And that's what that's what our objection is. If you want to sum it up, is that the the registry is not just a, a, an accumulation of a database of names. It's a way of restricting people in their behavior, what they're allowed to do, and for the remainder of the, mostly for the remainder of their life, even after they've paid their debt in full to society, they continue to be punished and restricted. So my first question would be is like about the, um, after you serve a prison sentence, it isn't always the case that you're essentially done, you've like paid your debt to society, you're at zero again. Like there's many cases where 
uh, like you have probation officers, you have a three strike rule, you have like in many states, you lose the right to vote. So just serving a prison sentence doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're you've served your debt to society and you're back at zero like any other citizen. So I don't see that that argument against the sex offender registry is necessarily supported because in the criminal justice system, after serving your prison time, you aren't completely free. I need to clarify. I'm not talking about just serving your prison time. I'm talking about you've served your prison time and your probation and parole and all your obligations related to your conviction. The registry is unrelated to your, I mean, it is directly related because you have to have a conviction to be required to register, but it lasts beyond your sentence, beyond your probation, beyond your parole, beyond all that stuff. After you've paid your fines, it is something that lingers uh, potentially for the rest of your life in many states. Was that different from losing the right to vote after you've committed a felony? Well, that is, in our country, there are some states where you're forever disenfranchised, but that's the very small minority of states. Most states, your right to vote is restored upon the completion of your sentence. Some states, it's it's restored upon the completion of your prison time, not just your sentence, but in more states, the more common thing is after you've served and paid your debt in full to society, meaning your probation parole. But in a few states, particularly in New Hampshire, and I think it's actually Vermont and Maine, but a couple of, of New England states, they never actually but you never actually forfeit your right to vote. You can vote well, immediately. Yeah, you're never disenfranchised. But the general rule is after you do your time and pay your debt in full, you're restored to your normal pre-conviction status. In Vermont, you can but... vote while you're still locked up even, right? That's what I was saying. There's a couple of states where you never lose that, that right to, to begin with. But that's a, that's a sliver of the 50. There's only, I think, two, maybe three. Well, that would be, so that would be why I disagree with your initial argument that simply serving your prison sentence and getting your parole doesn't necessarily mean that you're off the hook at that point because there are cases like voting registration that are voting, losing your right to vote that do extend past your prison sentence and your parole and many other, in the cases of many other crimes as well. But like the best argument I could make for the sex offender registry is that if sex offenses were a type of crime that presented such a risk to society that they were different from other types of crime that would justify creating a registry so people can like look up and be aware of the danger around them. Um, but I, when I did the research after talking to you guys, I couldn't find any evidence of that being the case. I couldn't find of any evidence that sex offenses had a higher recidivity rate or higher rate of committing crimes again. It actually seems like they have a much lower rate uh, of committing secondary crimes or repeat offenses as other crimes. And I found no evidence that the sex offender registry prevents future sexual assaults or so little that this is not noticeable by any of the data I found. And so even though I disagree with your first argument, I don't think that simply serving your time necessarily invalidates some kind of future punishment established by the state if it's losing voting rights or whatever. I think that the best argument against the sex offender registry is the fact that, as far as I can tell, uh, it doesn't work and it doesn't accurately portray criminals. Like, because there's there's lots of different ridiculous crimes that you can get you on there, like peeing in public in certain states, right? Sure. Well, the the, the voting is not the, not being able to vote is not a punishment per se. It's it's a collateral consequence, so to, so to speak. But but being restricted in terms of where you can live, where you can work, what you can do, not being able to vote doesn't restrict you in any way and where you can live, where you can work, what you can, who you can have an affair with. Who you, I mean, it's just, it's, it's one small thing. It's an important thing, but I, I don't see, I don't see that I can agree with your, with your analysis that you continue to be punished. I don't think anybody ever would argue that having to report to a police station and being told you cannot live anywhere, you cannot work, you cannot hold this job, you cannot have a relationship with this person, even after you've paid your debt to society. All those things can be imposed on you while you're paying your debt to society. They can control where you live. They can control where you work. They can control all of those things. But once you've paid your debt to society, you should be able to reintegrate and assume your normal status as, as you were pre- previously and convicted. Well, my objection here is that the paid your debt to society isn't established by your crime time. Like the debt to society could go far after your prison sentence. Like it could be a law could say that your debt to society includes your permanent loss of this right, right X, Y, and Z. And that could be a part of your debt to society if you've committed a certain crime. And that is established in many other things like losing your voting rights. So the fact that uh, you served your prison sentence doesn't necessarily mean you are done with your debt to society in the case of certain crimes. And so the fact that your your argument that because you've 
done your prison time and you've done your parole time and there's this extenuating um, punishment imposed on you, that extenuating punishment would necessarily be beyond the bounds of what you what you're owed back to society isn't actually a valid argument because there are many types of crimes that do have extenuating punishments. And so the served your debt to society argument doesn't seem to be a valid argument to me because there are cases where that debt can go beyond just a prison sentence and parole. And Larry, so it would make sense that it could I, in I, the other cases as well. I think we need to, to iron out what, like, like w when you get a sentence that you are, you are obligated to serve X number of years, whether that's in or out with, uh, with extra supervision. But once that time is over, that's the end of your sentence. Certain people get sentenced to super duper long times, life, 10 life sentences, et cetera. But you end up with someone that has a 20 year sentence at the end of those 20 years. That is, that is what Larry is referring to as paying your debt to society. Yet someone that serves those 20 years will then have all this extra obligation of punishment. As far as I know, Larry, and please correct me if I'm wrong, nobody else has crimes like that. Once you're done, you're just done. There's no extra stuff that goes on after your sentence is finished. Well, there, there, there are some, there are some occupational debarments that take place uh, as, as a, as a result of your conviction. But as far as having your liberties restricted and your movement restricted, I can't think of a crime uh, that that imposes all the disabilities and restraints of the sexual offender registry. I really can't. But well, terrorism but, would be one, but that's not the point. So the point here that I. I like this, the reason this is a bad argument is because your debt to society is determined by the judges, not by your prison sentence. So once you've turned your prison sentence, they can say you have an extra debt to society you have to pay. Perfectly uh -uh. legal to do that. Ex post facto. No, it's not. Well, I was going to get to that, Andy. That's, the, the, I, know, I know, I know, I know. You literally can do that. That's like, that's why you, people can't vote in certain states. You literally can have an extra debt beyond your prison sentence. That's totally le legal. But... There are definitely conditions. I, I don't think it's fair. I think it's wrong to do this. But that isn't a good argument because there are lots of different crimes where you can have extra rights taken away beyond your prison sentence all the time. Like voting rights is an obvious example. Terrorism is an obvious example. Losing your citizenship. Deportation. There's lots of examples. So just saying that you've necessarily served your debt to society, therefore your debt is paid and you're completely void of any other... Uh, payment is just, it's not a good argument. There, and well, this, there are well, far better arguments. Like, I agree with you. I don't think the sex offender registry is moral. I think it's a bad thing. This is not one of the reasons, though. Sure. Well, I mean, that's a great thing about the country. You can have your opinion, but I can't think of an offense where, I mean, terrorism, once you pay your debt to society, again, when you've paid your prison and your probation and parole, the judge doesn't determine. The judge imposes it, but the laws of the land determine what, what the available sentence is. And if the available sentence is 30 years, and that's all they can give you. And when you're done, even if you commit an act of terrorism, you're free to go. Now, they may deport you if you're not an American citizen, but but you you would be able to, I mean, uh, 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 Arthur Brimmer, we talked about this, and he's the one that shot Governor Wallace in 72. He served his time, and he's free to go about his life. But but anyway, I'm going to buy your argument for the sake of this, for this discussion. I would agree with you for the sake of discussion. But what about people who had no, well, you know, when you commit the felony, you're going to lose your right to vote. What about people who had no idea that they were going to have all these disabilities and restraints that were imposed on them after the fact? They had no prior notice, which is the very essence of the ex post facto clause. You're supposed to be put on notice in advance of what what your debilitation, what what disabilities will be uh, be imposed on you and what your loss of liberties and what your punishment will be. What about people who committed their sexual offense 30 years ago? And the law was changed, and all of a sudden they find themselves with all these restrictions. That was no part of the discussion. That was not an informed decision. Is that okay as well? Uh, no, that would be illegal. So uh, retroactive laws that apply to people, like if you change the law in the future and then apply the change to people in the past, that would definitely be illegal. But well, it, it's not. It's not. Said, it, it's not in the case of the sex offender registry. It's done all the time. So well, I think it actually it still it still technically is unconstitutional in the in the. Supreme Court has actually ruled on this against a few states who have tried to impose this. And so it is getting better. It's improving. I definitely agree with you that this is a very unfair thing that is taken advantage from in many states. But the Supreme Court does seem to be moving 
more towards um, rejecting those laws. Which, as which, which, which Supreme Court? Not the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court is consistently, when they've dealt with this, I mean, some state Supreme Courts have, but the U.S. Supreme Court has has has, has consistently said it's okay. They said that in Smith versus Doe. They said it in Connecticut Department of Public Safety versus Doe. And those are the two landmark cases, but the Supreme Court has, has largely said the registry is okay and it's, it's being imposed ex post facto, and they continued to constantly ramp up the the disabilities and restraints, and no matter how far they go, they seem to get away with it by and large. But with a few exceptions, there are there are some state supreme courts have drawn the line. But but that's our whole point is is that that you it, it's never enough. They the the victims advocates and the 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 law enforcement industrial complex they never have enough disabilities. They have enough of, never have enough of your flesh. They continue to change the rules. You've been on the registry for ten years. You think you're going to get off? They change the law and say, well, now we require twenty. And they, they do that all the time. Right. There's there's lots of cases that go against it, but there are, I have read many recent cases, like there is a unanimous ruling. The court said that the state's requirement that sex offenders must register for life without any opportunity for judicial review violates due process. Um, and so there's lots of cases that I've read that actually have gone towards changing the sex offender registry as well. Now, obviously there's lots that haven't and have gone in the wrong direction, but there does seem to be progress made more recently yes. Yes, going we're, in the right direction. We're, 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 we're making progress slowly through the courts. Uh, to challenge, but it's taken a lot, of, a lot of years and a lot of of people being deprived of their constitutional rights with very little recourse. But yep, I, I totally understand. That's definitely super, super unfair. Kind of like uh, Jim Crow laws that was legal for, in, for many years in the United States, and it took many years to change that, and lots of activism. And so I definitely appreciate what you guys are doing in the same vein as Martin Luther King and other activists fighting for the rights of people who do have their rights violated. Um, and so I can definitely empathize with how hard your struggle is and definitely how unfair the sex offender registry is in many cases. Certain states are, are significantly worse than other ones, too, that uh, we already spoke is, about. Is it the Republican ones? <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> Specifically, I was going to say states in like the Northeast are significantly easier than those that are in like the Bible Belt, which I we talk about it pretty regularly, like the level of hypocrisy that that is of all about some forgiveness and whatnot yet they have in and that's just criminal justice in in general that they have the hardest prison sentences that prisons are crappy versus other places larry you're going to say something no you, you're doing fine keep going okay uh if, if, that would pretty much end it so is it blue versus red i there, you could probably make a very very good venn diagram of it working out that way i don't want it because california also has a very very crappy registry and that's a blue more blue state so it, there are exceptions to the rule but generally speaking it works out that way so what, what is your guys interpretation of the reason the registry was put into place when it was put into place what what was the goal of this as a as a legislation larry will answer way better but i think it comes down to the handful of high super high profile cases of the of jacob letterling and megan conk and i think that's how it's pronounced i can't i always screw that one up but i think those are couple of really high profile cases, knee jerk reactions, and everyone says we have to save every kid. Well, the, the Wetterling Act in 94 was to have, purportedly to have a ready-made database of names because investigating a disappearance of a child, which was the driving thing behind the Wetterling Act because Jacob disappeared, those, those moments and hours can be very important. And the, the thought was that having not having to go figure out who the people were that might be suspects already having a list would be helpful. So the first generation registries were not that intrusive. Basically, they were just a list where you had to keep your address current, kind of like a young man that registered for the draft. You have to keep your registration current until you're 26 years old. But then they realized that they could inflict punishment without being challenged. So they en ended up continuing to pile on more and more restrictions. It sounds really good. So the the victims of crimes and the advocates of victims and the law enforcement apparatus, they come forward and say, well, if we didn't allow the people on the registry to do X, Y, and Z, and they just invent new requirements year after year after year, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. And it never stops. And then Congress passed the Adam Walsh Act in 2006 because of gaps in the Wetterling Act. They, they figured out after nearly 12 years of having all the states with some form of registry that some of the states really weren't particularly interested in enforcing the registration requirements. Because if you stop and think about it, and, and I get a hate mail for saying this, but when you stop and think about it, 
if people who commit sex crimes are as bad as you would like the public to believe they are, and as dangerous as you'd like the public to believe they are, when they leave your state, you'd be happy. So what happened prior to the Adam Walsh Act was that states would be celebrating someone who was supposed to register when they concluded to the best of their investigative resources that they had left their state. So when, when you left Alabama and you went to Idaho, Alabama was happy because you were going to be committing whatever offense and misbehavior in Idaho. Idaho didn't know you were there, so they couldn't get you registered. Alabama was happy you were gone, but there was no incentive for them to, why would you want the person back so they could offend in Alabama? So you were celebrating their, de- their departure. Well, Congress said that that's no way to run a system. We've got states where they don't care that the offenders have absconded, and there was, purportedly was 100,000 who had chosen to move and just quit registering. So therefore, they created a, a, a nuance in federal law in the Adam Walsh Act that a, a allows the federal government to go apprehend people who don't comply with the state registration requirements. So if you leave Alabama and Alabama reports to the under the Adam Walsh Act that you're no longer compliant, then the feds open up an investigative file and the marshals go out and track you down and they will federally prosecute you. But what's driving that is the belief that these people, despite the broad list of things that are registered, including consensual activity between between folks that are of similar age, but not necessarily of legal age. There are so many people in the registry, but the average citizen doesn't realize that in preparation for this program, you probably had no idea that a 19-year-old can be on the sex offender registry for life for having sex with a 17-year-old consensually in, in some of our states because that's below the age of consent. And they may have a family together and they may be prohibited from uh, going on the school property and interacting with that kid's teachers and counselors because they're on the sex offender registry. The, the average person I was doesn't know that. Uh, there's a number of things that I found very strange that you get on the Sex Offender Act for. Like one was urinating in public. That just seems ridiculous. How, why would you be put on the Sex Offender Act for urinating in public? That, that doesn't make any sense. Or uh, taking pictures of yourself when you're underage and having pictures of your own underage self on your phone can get you on the Sex Offender Act. Like, oh my God. That's dumb. Larry, re- remember the case we talked about on the podcast uh, about a, it was probably 18 months ago. There was the kid that sent, he, I think he was 17 and he sent a picture of his junk to his girlfriend. So therefore he possessed child porn and was also drib- distributing child porn of himself. That was, I believe that was out of the state of Maryland and that's a blue state, but, but the, the Maryland Supreme Court upheld the conviction but because they said that they don't make laws, they just simply interpret them. And that was the law that the people of Maryland chose to enact through their due process of their of electing their representatives and senators. And if the people don't want that, they need to go about changing that law. It's not for them to legislate from the bench. But that's absolutely true. And, and, and possession and distribution of child porn is a very serious offense in most states, even though there's no rape. See, the average person thinks that this is a, a, a registry of rapists and child molesters. There are very few actual child molesters and rapists. There's an awful lot of people for things like you just described. Urinating in public is kind of a bit overblown. It is a registrable offense, but that's a very small number of people on the registry. It, it shouldn't be there at all. And in fact, the Adam Walsh Act doesn't even recommend, the feds do not recommend that that be on the list of registrable offenses. States choose to do it, but it's not one that's covered by the Adam Walsh Act or any or even the predecessor of the Jacob Wettering Act. They never recommended that you register indecent exposure. But there's so many things on there that you would never imagine that could get you in trouble. The consensual thing, when a parent calls me and they say, my son, can you believe this? He's 19 years old and he was dating his girlfriend that he was seeing in high school and he's a little bit older than her. And now that he's over 19, he's charged with a sexual crime because her parents got mad. I said, yep, I can believe it. And uh, well, that's just not right. I said, well, isn't it the law of your state? Well, I guess it is. Well. You were for those who took advantage of children until it happened to your child, weren't you? And it's usually from lack of knowledge. Of course, that person would not have been for that had they known it. But the average person doesn't know the breadth, the breadth of what all is listed on the sexual offender registry. They have no idea that it's not just rapists. Most of the rapists are actually in prison, <laughs> but they have no idea you the type a, of people that are on the they're on the registry. You have like a percent of how many actually violent crimes are a part of the registry. I wish I did. I I struggle with that because of the way they describe uh, the, the define violent crimes. A lot of states will call something violent simply because the age of the victim, 
Uh, but yet there was no violence, but they listed as a violent crime. So it's very difficult to really compose that data that, that you and I are looking for because they deem it violent simply because it's, it's the age. I mean, if you have sex with a 16-year-old, uh, that's a minor, and you're an adult, that's a violent No, it isn't a violent crime. <laughs> so, uh, Don Fullman asked, is it dangerous to be a part of the registry due to targeting? Absolutely. There are people who are, who are beat. There are people who are killed. There's been a number of high-profile killings, and they do everything they can, they being the law enforcement, to, to disconnect from saying, we don't have any conclusive proof that it was because they're on the registry. But occasionally, the person will announce that they're doing the heinous act because the, the, the person made a registry. I think the most recent thing we talked about was out in Nebraska, I think two or three episodes back, where a person was sentenced to prison for targeting a, a person on the registry and killed the person. But wasn't it just two or three episodes back, Andy? Yes, it was. Uh, we, the guy, well, it was like six months ago that he killed him, but he just got sentenced to 40 to 70 years for killing. It was just a vigilante, vigilante kill. Uh, a registrant moved into his neighborhood and he didn't like the way that he was looking around and went up to the door, had a confrontation with him, pulled out his gun and killed him. So, yes, it's a dangerous thing to be on the, on the registry with the home addresses, with such specificity. It's essentially essentially a, a, a target on your, on your face and your forehead. Uh, is there anything that you think the registry could be used for? Like what it, if it was done well, what would it accomplish or could it be <laughs> accomplished? Well, what, what, how would you change about it to make it better? The reason well, why I'm well, laughing is because Larry and I talk about this pretty regularly of what a constitutional registry would look like. And that's why I'm laughing. Well, what a, what a, see, I, I always worry about being constitutional and therefore you can do a limited registry as long as you don't imp impose punishment. So a, a constitutional registry would look like this. You would take their name, their biographical data, maybe their DNA, and you would tell them like you tell young men who are, have to register for selective service, that you have an obligation to report any change of your residence with us. Uh, your residents uh, report that to us within X number of days after any changes. The people would be free to go and live their life, to be employed, to have relationships. And if, if they offend again, we would do what we do with any other crime. We would arrest them again and prosecute them again and generally sentence them more harshly. The answer is we would do what we do with other criminals. If you sell drugs to a kid, we lock you up. If you get out from prison and you pay your debt to society and you get off probation and parole and you sell drugs to a child again, we lock you up again. That's what we would do. And that, what, So what I would do is make the registry a, a database of people. I don't support it, but if I had to design a constitutional registry, I would have the database for law enforcement use only. We would not disclose addresses, and we would not impose any disabilities or restraints on people after they've done their time and after they've served out the duration of their sentence. While they're paying their debt, if they're on probation, you can have significant restrictions on your liberty. That's a given. But a constitutional registry, you can't do that, and you would not be changing the rules and enhancing the requirements after people have begun their registration period. Uh, Don Fullman asks, uh, what does it take to get off the registry? Do you know anyone that should be on the registry because they are so bad? Other than Don. I'm sure there are people out there that are, that are pretty bad. But again, if they pay their debt to society, I don't, I, I don't use that as my standard. It, if, they, if they pay their debt, they should be free to go about their life. So I don't, I don't know what, what I would justify, who would, who, would, who would deserve to be on the registry. The registry would end when your sentence ends in my world. And if you did anything more than that, it would be merely an accumulation of names and bi biographical and maybe DNA and identification type information. And at, at best case scenario, you would keep your address current, but there would be no additional, there would be no additional requirements on the person. That would be a constitutional registry. What, did I get the question right? Because I think I might have missed part of it. Yeah, that was the second part. The first part was, uh, what does it take to get off the registry? What does it take to get off the registry? Well, it varies. Some states, there are no way off. You have, the, like the case you referred to in South Carolina, that's the state I think you're talking about where a decision came down without due process. You can't get off. It's a lifetime obligation. But in states where you can get off, it's a petition process where the person has to serve X number of years and they have to file a petition. And the standard is generally on the offender to show that they do not present a danger. That petition is, is served on the prosecutor of that jurisdiction where they were convicted. 
and the the victim oftentimes has a say if there's if it's not a victimless crime the victim would have a say if it's a victimless crime like like for example a, a, an internet sting where there was not an actual victim then there would be no one to be notified but if there was actual a victim they would be notified and they come in and tell their story and the judge either grants the petition or denies it and then the person may be able to file again after a period of time a couple of years up to five years they can file again so it usually involves hiring an attorney expending money for a cycle sexually eval going to court and waiting for an answer that's what the process looks like if it exists at all uh so most uh sexual assaults usually happen between friends and family correct and so simply knowing that there is some random person down the street who you don't have any interaction with happens to be a sex offender wouldn't likely prevent any sexual offenses anyway so it doesn't seem like in principle the registry is going to be able to accomplish anything except maybe in the cases of informing friends and family, but they would presumably know anyway, right? Well, that's that's a discussion I try to steer clear of to some degree because of that very reason. It's hard to prove the absence of, of something of being a benefit. I don't know how many people who have a neighbor on the registry who have taken extraordinary precautions and kept their kid away even if the person didn't even have a, a child victim i don't know that that how many relatives of, of someone who might not have known but do know because they're on the registry and they've taken precautions but statistically it's not measurable we know that your research uh, revealed that and we we know that we know that there's not a way to verify that it does any significant <laughs> deterrence but it's hard to say it doesn't save one but if that's the argument i mean we could do a lot of things that would save one I, I tell people over and over again, if if, you, if it's about saving one, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you some examples that would save at least one if you want to trample the Constitution. If you're okay with trampling the Constitution to save one, we could start looking at gun restrictions. If you were to slow down the rapidity of fire, uh, firepower, these mass shootings, the number of victims would drop if you can't shoot as fast. So that would save at least one. But people don't want to do that. If you wanted to have routine random searches at night in people's homes without without any probable cause, just knocking at the door and saying, we're going to we're going to come in. You don't mind us looking around and bringing our dogs in to, to sniff for drugs. There'd be a massive amount of drugs flushed. And if you did that for, for a period of time, you would have a, a, a significant diminishment of drugs. But that's not a society I want to live in. And I don't want to live in a society where they impose punishment on people after they've served their sentence. But that's what we do here. So what? Um... What, you said that a constitutional registry is one where they just record their names and da- data and say not to move, or have to, every time they have to move, they have to like uh, inform people that they've moved. But no form of this would be accessed to the public. No one else would have it other than the government, correct? I think that would clearly be a constitutional registry. How much beyond that we can go, that's for the courts to decide. But I think clearly that would be a constitutional registry if you went no further than that. What do you think would be a good deterrent or something that would help deter sexual assaults that we could add to the registry? Well, uh, I, I've never really thought about that because I don't want to use the registry as a deterrent. Uh, the, 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 the registry to be constitutional, it can't be punishment. That's one of the tests of the U.S. Supreme Court is, is it's not, it's, it can only be used as a regulatory scheme to, to not impose any disabilities or restraint. So I don't, I don't, I don't sit around trying to think of ways that we can deter people with the registry. That's not what it's for. It was designed to help law enforcement to investigate and eliminate the wasteful time trying to figure out who the possible suspects would be. So I don't, I don't think I'm really going to be a good one to answer that question. What, what could we do to deter people with the registry? Because I, I would never support anything in, in, the, in that direction. Uh, can people, you said that there's different requirements and effects of the registry in different states. So if someone goes from a state where it's very stringent to a state where it's not as stringent, is that a way to evade some of the consequences of the unfair registry? Yes, it is. And people do that. People do do that very thing. They do state shopping and they compare the terms of registration and the restrictions in the various states. And if they have that option, they move. This, it, the way to look at it is the state that you are registering in, since it's a civil regulatory scheme, it would be like you taking your car from one state to the other. When you take your car from a state that is very lax on on registration requirements, maybe they don't inspect your car for for emissions and they don't worry about that type of thing, and you take it to a state that's much stricter, the state where you go, their stricter requirements would 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 uh, take over and they would be the controlling requirements. Well, the same thing happens in reverse when you when you go from a state 
where the registry is lifetime with no way off, that no longer goes with you because that's a regulatory scheme in Florida. If you if you go to another state that has a removal process, then you, they control that. So yes, people do that. They they it would it would be nutty if you didn't do that. If you if you had the option to to get off of of those restrictions, and you had the option and the ability financially to move, I don't know why you wouldn't. Are you a first time listener of Registry Matters? Well, then make us a part of your daily routine and subscribe today. Just search for Registry Matters through your favorite podcast app, hit the subscribe button, and you're off to the races. You can now enjoy hours of sarcasm and snark from Andy and Larry on a weekly basis. Oh, and there's some excellent information thrown in there, too. Subscribing also encourages others of you people to get on the bandwagon and become regular Registry Matters listeners. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to Registry Matters right now. Help us keep fighting and continue to say F-Y-P. One of the reasons that I wanted to bring us together, though, was to uh, discuss about that, if it is in a moral place, because T-Jump often has conversations with folks about the morality of it. And we often talk about on the podcast of the overarching impact that the whole structure of it has on how people live. And only recently in the last about 18 months or so with people being isolated, people not being able to go out and about and people start screaming about all of their rights and they start screaming about how the mental health aspect of being isolated away from everybody is so horrifying. And everyone that I know that is on the register, they're like, man, that's, this is just another day in my life. So imposing all of these uh, social structure restrictions, work rest- uh, structure restrictions, where you can live, who you can associate with, there is a huge impact on your psyche. And it seems like it then moves into a moral discussion about how much this is uh, damaging for people to live. We are social creatures, but you make them completely ostracized from even like walking outside the door. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's definitely immoral. Most of the things the government does is immoral. I think the important question is like, is it pragmatic? Kind of like um, the TSA. The TSA um, is complete garbage. It does absolutely nothing. It protects no one from anything ever. But it makes people feel safe. And that safety that they feel does have an economic benefit. Um, the fact that people feel safer at the TSA makes them buy more tickets, which causes the economy to grow. And so even though the TSA is a gigantic waste of money for the government and does absolutely nothing to protect anybody, it does benefit the economy, which is why we waste so much money on it. And so this, there could be an argument that maybe the registry does the same kind of a thing where it gives people comfort and makes them feel good, kind of like religion does. It's just a complete arse, but it makes people feel more comfortable, which then has some kind of an economic benefit. So because religion, even though religion is complete nonsense, it does make people comfortable, which has lots of positive psychological influences. So do you think that would be a potential argument for the registry is the fact that it makes people in society feel safer, even though it doesn't it doesn't work at all. Do you get to squash my uh, constitutional rights to make you feel good? That's what the TSA does. <laughs> um, I think that ends up to be different, though, it, because you are not required to fly. And that is something of a privilege. You can get there other ways by taking a bus or drive. And I realize that going from New York to California would be very challenging if you wanted to hop in your car for the 3,500 miles or whatever that is. Um, but outside of that, just just a person that is on the registry that is then, I don't want to use Facebook as the example, but you can't be on Facebook. Facebook's accessible, but that is where everybody is and you can't be there. So now that is one level of ostracization. And then you move into where you can and can't work and where you can and can't live. Hey, you, go back, go back. You, can't, you can't be on Facebook if you're Fa- on the registry. Facebook has most social media sites have a clause written in there. T- however you want to word it. It says, if you've ever been convicted of a sexual offense, you can't be here. Something like Ooh, that. Wow. Did not know that. That is, that's definitely but that's ridiculous. A, that's a private company. And I did a, a video on our YouTube channel that talks about this because somebody called and asked me about it. And it was like, oh, they shut down my Facebook account. And now I, he was running a Facebook marketplace thing. So he's buying and selling, swapping goods, whatever. And that was the only way that he could figure out how to make money. And they kicked him off of there. But from my point of view, Facebook is a private company. I think it's an asshole decision, but they can do that if they want to. Because they're a private company. It's not a government-controlled entity. But 
could the government say you can't use a road because you've been on the registry? You would have lots of problems then, but Facebook, like, okay. So, well, I, I, uh, I want to get back to what he said, if you don't mind about the TSA, and I don't really want to divert the conversation to the TSA, but it's a, it's a great comparison because uh, I think there's merit to what he says. The, the registry does make people feel good. The average person, miss, they're miss, so misinformed or uninformed that they think that the registry is doing all these wonderful things. And the same thing with the TSA. The TSA, I will never say it hasn't saved anything, but I can say this, that with no TSA, there will never be another 9-11 done the way 9-11 was done because the passengers will never tolerate that again. They will never allow themselves to be a missile and flown into a building if someone tries to take over an aircraft. With, with or without the TSA, that, that won't be allowed to happen again. <laughs> and, and, but it's a lot of theater there. In terms of, I mean, I have been fondled and groped at the TSA probably more than any middle-aged white guy that I can think of. Uh, and they, I get this because I wear gloves at the airport because I have a skin condition that makes me very susceptible to bruising. So grabbing luggage and b- being in places where I, I'm likely to bump my hands, I'm going to be bruised and they take weeks to heal. And so therefore I wear gloves. And I get randomly selected every time I'm at the airport to be groped and fondled for extra security. And they always tell me it's random. And I know it's not random. Somehow or another, at some point in the line, down the line, they've noticed I've got these gloves. And I try to ditch them by the time I get to the screening point because I know that I'm going to get singled out. But I get, I get that special treatment. And it doesn't do anything to make the traveling public safer. All that theater that they do of having people uh, basically strip and they go up and down your pant leg and behind your back and on your stomach and all this stuff is theater. But it makes the people that are the rest of the line feel wonderful. They think you're a villain and they think that they have just saved the aircraft they're about to get on from an inevitable catastrophe. So I agree with you on that. And that's what the registry is. It, there's a lot of people who feel good that there's all these things when the cops go door to door checking to see if you live where you and they make all this commotion, banging at your door, making sure every dog in the neighborhood's barking. And if no one answers, they leave these bright orange flyers saying the sex offender unit was here. And and they talk to the neighbors and say, have you seen this offender? We haven't been able to make contact with them for at least three weeks now. And, and we're kind of a little bit worried. That makes people feel good. But the person hasn't committed a crime in 34 years. Their, their crime happened in 1990. And they've been living a law-abiding life. They've never would, never have expected to be on the registry until the law was retroactively changed. They've got a family, and yet they're going through all this theater. It is exactly what it is. It, it's good for public consumption. Okay, that's enough rant. Are there any other interesting points or topics that we haven't talked about yet that you guys wanted to bring up? Well, we did we did have a lot of stuff that was on the list, but I think you've covered a fair amount of it. Uh, Andy, do you see anything that wasn't on the suggested list? I do not think so. Do, do you want to discuss the uh, why don't why don't we beat around about what registration goes over as far as the information that you have to give to the the man, the popo, every uh, depending on where you are and what your level is that you might go in. So many people they just go in annually. And it's just like you've been booked for a crime. I'm pretty sure that your fingerprints don't change. Maybe in your lifetime, maybe from the time that you're a a, a wee young kid to the time that you're an adult, your fingerprint probably modifies. But otherwise, it doesn't change. But you have to get your fingerprints taken, and you have to have your photo taken, and you have to uh, uh, give your address updates, and you often give your vehicle and so forth. And you, like, give relatives, like, you give a whole bunch of information for, as Larry was just describing, uh, a crime that may have committed in 1990, here it is 2021, and now you're still giving this information up. So, so well, the, the, it's, it's really a humiliating experience because unlike a true civil regulatory scheme where you would go, most people, the worst experience of their life is going to motor vehicles. The average person hates that. The average person on the registry, they would be delighted if that's all they had to go through in the registration process is what you go through at motor vehicles, which is a bureaucrat that tells you you don't have the right paperwork in order. But it's it's so it's so designed to humiliate and to remind you that you're a creep that you go through that. But the 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 more important thing to me, I mean that is gross enough, but the more important thing to me is the ex post facto that you that you may have not had any idea it was coming. 
a lot of people are on the registry where where their crimes predate the even existence of registry, or the registry has had the the requirements enhanced multiple times during the during their during their registration period with a continuation of adding more and more restraints on their liberty. That's the most egregious thing about it. They they continue to pile on and pile on and pile on, which is what the courts were beginning to look at. They're saying, hey, you can't keep doing that. That's what happened in Michigan with the Doe's versus Snyder uh, one and uh, Snyder one and Doe's versus Snyder two. Those cases were saying, hey, you just can't keep changing the rules and putting more and more disabilities and restraints on people in a supposed civil civil regulatory scheme. So that's what bothers me. And then this these risk levels, they don't really do a risk assessment. Very few states actually look at your individualized risk because the Adam Walsh Act, the federal legislation in 2006, no longer encourages that. They used to encourage the, to, to look at the individualized risk, but now they look at your crime. So it's based on the crime. And most states don't even tier them correctly, but your tier three level may be inappropriate because your crime actually was not recommended by the feds to be at a tier three, but in a tier three, the public thinks you're the most heinous criminal and you may have simply had sex with a minor by consent. And that makes you a tier three offender because the person was under a certain age. And most states go, they use a higher age than what the actual tier three requirements are. There's so many things where, where the registry, even if they were following the strict requirements that the feds have in their system for you to be deemed eligible for your precious federal funding, the states go way beyond that. They put requirements in, like, for example, we talked about the uh, indecent exposure. That's not even a sex offense that the feds care anything about states registry, but yet they do. So, but, uh, but Don, Don asked, uh, can you talk about the restrictions the registry has in living areas near schools, churches, and Halloween restrictions? Great, great question. There, now, there are some states, like my state, where there, there are no such requirements. You can live anywhere you want to here, and you can work anywhere you want to if they'll hire you, and you can, you, you're, you're, you don't have those disabilities. But in most of the states, there are some level of, of prohibitions. Of Now, your, your offense may not have anything to do with children, and the overwhelming majority of the offenses don't have anything to do with children. I mean, they're, they're, I can't give the percentages, but I'm, I'm satisfied from the 20 years I've been in the legal business that there are a lot of people on the sex offender registry that never offended against a child. But anyway, that those are the typical the restrictions. It would be it would be uh, uh, schools, anything that they can that they can consider daycare or a school or a place where children might congregate. That they would be prohibited against being loitering, which they find loitering very broadly being being present. So you end up that you can't go to McDonald's because there's a playground there. You know, most McDonald's have the the, the playland for the children. So therefore, you're technically, in, a, in some of the states, you're in violation if you go to McDonald's and want to eat inside their res restaurant. But I mean, have you ever heard of anyone being molested at a McDonald's? I haven't. Then some of the, some of the school prohibitions prevent people from voting because their precinct is at a school. So they have to vote absentee because they're not allowed to vote. I mean, it goes on and on. There was a that we uh, a conference several years ago, there was an attorney that brought up a map of North Carolina and they had, I guess they were probably a thousand foot restrictions. And these are presence restrictions. These are places that you are not allowed to be present. And so one of them, maybe like at the legislative office, there was like an in-house daycare place and you can't be a thousand feet from a daycare, but that's the legislative office. If you wanted to go to talk to your legislator, that's where they would be. And you're not allowed to be in that space. I'm pretty sure I characterized that right. Did I get the details right on that, Larry? You, you, you did. There are people who, who, one of your fundamental rights is to petition government for redress of your grievances. But the capital is off limits to, in some, some instances because of the proximity of the capital to, to those lists of, exclusion, of exclusions that you're not allowed to be president. Now, I would, I would totally, I would do what Rosa Parks did. I would say the day is not going to come when you're going to prohibit me from going to my capital. So you'll just have to arrest me. But most people are not willing to face the significant criminal act, which is a felony in almost all of our states, and it's subject to habitual enhancement in most of our states. So you end up with a with dozens of years, or maybe twenty years, of for violating the registry because that's one of the things you're not allowed not allowed to place you're not allowed to be. But if you can't go to your capital to petition for redress of your grievances, then we're in a sad state of affairs. I want to be clear about something um, over on the Discord side? Someone's asking about the. Uh... 
we're not talking about whether how, how long the punishment is. We're not trying to necessarily talk about reducing that side of it. We're talking about the, the registration side. You could be sentenced to an infinity number of years. That is what your legislative body has ordered you to do for the crime that you've committed. The argument that we're, the, the, the topic and the idea that we're trying to present is that after you've served your time, that all of the extra garbage that you go through is, is where the line gets crossed. Yeah. It's the not registry, that, uh, the, the registry is not a part of your sentence. It's a collateral consequence. You're told that you will have an obligation to register as a result of this offense. But when you stand before a judge, the judge, judge doesn't say, I am sentencing you to 10 years or 20 years on the registry. That's not the way it works. The, the registry is an afterthought, and it's a civil requirement that has nothing to do with it, you, it being pronounced upon you by a judge. And the judge merely apprises you at the time of your sentence if there was an existence, it was an existence that you must comply with registration. But so we're not arguing about your punishment, although I think the sentences are too long in America. We are the incarceration capital of the world. We have 5% of the population and we have 25 plus percent of all the incarcerated individuals. There's something wrong with that picture, but that's a discussion we're not having. Yeah, so, so I mean, overall, I think I would agree with your position that the registry itself is horribly immoral. Definitely, for sure, way overblown. It doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't prevent future sexual assaults. It, most of the sexual assaults aren't by people on the list. So it's not a good way to try and find perpetrators when a crime has been committed. So I don't, as far as I know, it doesn't have any positive benefits. Um, there are definitely some people in the chat who disagree uh, fervently, apparently. But I think they're probably wrong. Was there anything else you guys wanted to talk about? Anything else we missed? I think I'm clear. Larry, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on before we, uh, we move on? I think we've done a stellar job, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys being here and chatting. I think there's a... Are, are we going to do any Q&A, though? Yes. So, people in the audience, uh, raise your hand if you want to come in the thing and chat, ask questions and stuff. I know that there's uh, two or three or four people that have a uh, pretty yeah, Nova, interesting Nova said, invite to speak. Nova has been bugging me on the... YouTube chat for like an hour. It's like, I want to come chat. What do you mean I've been bugging you for an hour? I've only been here for like 10 minutes. <laughs> Same thing. It's, it's like biblical hour. It's fine. Hey, good evening, uh, guys. Uh, sorry, I'm joining quite late. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself. Um, I'm part of the of an online group called the International Investigation Central, which is stands for the I, I, IIC. Uh, basically, what we do is we catch predators online, trying to actually sentence them, uh, which has been quite a success. Um, at least for certain things. Um, now, the sex offender registry. Now, on one hand, I do agree with it, uh, but on the other, I do get that's kind of rough and can actually quite affect your life. But do you think it would be any different if it wasn't there? Would what, what, what be any different? Like, if it, if the registry didn't exist, do you think it would just continue? Yep. What, uh, what, is it, is it, is it a deterrent? What, what are you asking me. would continue or what are you asking would be different? So what would As what in, continue? What, 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 would, what would be different if it wasn't there? But wouldn't well, destroy uh, their lives. Well, that would be, well, wouldn't well, damage their lives. That would be one thing. It'd be different. We would, we would be following the United States Constitution. Would be the biggest difference. And and uh, as I said earlier in the podcast, perhaps before you joined, what would be different if they if people offend again after they've gotten in trouble? We have ways of dealing with them, but we don't do predictive behavior and we don't restrict people's liberties because of what they might do. We punish them for what they have done for a period of time. But that punishment ends. They get to go about their life, and we have to take the chance that they may commit another infraction, like the person I mentioned that sells drugs to a kid on the school, outside the school grounds. We, we, we don't restrict that person after they've paid their debt to society. They can live where they want to. They can go where they want to. If they choose to sell drugs again and we catch them, we will lock them up again. But in terms of, of, the, of the thing about the uh, – I guess you're talking about internet stings. I vehemently, yes. oppo I vehemently oppose those. I think it's a it's a solution looking for a problem, in my opinion. Uh, I, I'm in the criminal defense business, so I probably have this view from my experience of what I've seen. There are so many, much, so many of these that are entrapment where the person thought they were in an adult room. The person posing as a child magically transitions and become, I mean, as an adult magically tra transitions to become a child, and they tantalize the person and convince them through by pretending that they're a minor. There are very few minors that are trying to have sex with adults. When you look at where there are really uh, adults soliciting minors, 
where they're soliciting a real child doesn't happen. Very rare. But what does happen day in, day out is we spend gobs of taxpayer resources setting up these elaborate stings so that these guys, they're mostly men, very few women, but mostly men, who are carrying on conversation, thinking they're looking for an adult date, and then what was an adult magically transitions to become a child, and they don't believe it. But they're tantalized enough by the very skillful adult that is misleading them that they show up for a meeting, and then all of a sudden, they're charged with this crime. But that's a solution in search of a problem, in in my view. I'm not entirely sure what what you were saying in this case. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Chris Hansen. Would you agree with him? I saw. I've, I've seen many episodes of Chris Hansen. I've defended cases like like what 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 they do, or what they did on that program. Absolutely, I've seen I've seen many cases. So you would agree that that is a form of you know that that is a good thing, but setting up these elaborate things to try and actually get them off the internet and make it slightly safer isn't. No, I don't agree with that. I, I just got through saying that. I I said I I believe that it's a, a solution in search of a problem. Uh, the 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 uh, these these are entrapment, but by and large, these are these are, are are adults who are doing a bait and switch with guys who thought they were chatting. Now, there, this this is generalization. There are there are some creepers out there that are looking to have sex with minors, and I don't condone that. But I do not condone spending vast amount of law enforcement resources and taxpayer resources to come in and convince a person that's not looking for a child that you really do want to have sex with me because I'm a child, but yet you were an adult when you started. I don't agree with that. I mean, you have the right in this country to say that that's a great thing. I disagree. So uh, would you be for legitimate online things that don't pretend, like start as adults and then entrap people by then transforming into children? If they are legitimately acting as children and don't manipulate would that be fine as an organization if you could actually demonstrate that and had complete recordings of the entire conversation? Absolutely. You did not. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. What, what, what we do is uh, most of the time we keep it as safe as possible. Uh, we keep it as platonic as possible. We never engage a person. They always engage us. Um, and if it does happen, we keep the conversation as natural as possible and do not try and trap them into a corner where they are forced to say sexual things. Um, now, in case there is any imminent danger or him mentioning something that might involve a minor close by, that's when we do take action. That's when we do pass along our information towards uh, the law enforcement wherever they are at. Um, now, if they ever do something with that, I'm not entirely aware because we never get anything back. Um, but yeah, it, to be fair, I, I get what you, where you come from. Um, but so, the internet sucks. All right? I'll be quite honest, there's a lot of creeps on here. And uh, then again, I do understand that not everyone has sex with a minor. Um, but on the other hand, don't you think that enticing that even over the computer is slightly like not very normal and shouldn't actually happen? Was, was that a question you were asking? Sure. Uh, yes. yeah. Hitting on a minor and trying to entice them is bad. Don't do that. Well, it would depend on it would depend on the age of the minor. If if the minor is of the age of consent and whatever the jurisdiction is, then then you you need to change your law if you think that. I mean, well, most of your parents and your grandparents would be sexual offenders under today's rules because the age of consent has increased in in recent decades. But I don't want to be the moral policeman that says to a sixteen year old if that is in fact the age of consent. In a particular state, I'm not going to be the one that tells you that you cannot have sex with a 24-year-old. That's not for me to determine if it's a lawful activity. That's for you to determine if it's a lawful activity. But but it, it's, it's like I'm not the moral police. So so if, if yeah, it's so, so in general, we're minor. We're just referring to people who is below the age of consent. If it's above the age of consent, then it's legal, and so you couldn't prosecute them or do yeah. anything on them anyway. So it's just by minor, we just colloquially referring to below. By minor, we, we usually mean around the age of 13 to 14. So, well, that's uh, young. Uh, yeah, that, yeah that, that, that is young. That uh, is. And uh, well, that I, I is could, mostly under any minor restrictions. I, I would agree with you on, on, on this. If, if, a, if a person magically transis, uh, transitions from being an adult to a 13 year old, every person that's engaging in a conversation should disengage from that conversation immediately. Unfortunately, exactly. they, they, they don't do it that. Doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. No, it doesn't. And, and a lot I've of times, seen... a lot of times they don't believe that the person's 13 year old because they've been too mature to be a 13 year old. They've talked, uh... they've talked at a level that the person 
I mean, they, they put on their act to try to sound like they're a 13 year old. They say, my mom is not here right now and all that kind of stuff. But most of them care, can carry on a conversation because they're adults pretending to be 13 year olds. But you should disengage. I agree with you on that. You should say you're 13 years old now. You've magically transitioned from being 24 to 13. I can no longer have a conversation with you. You should block the person. That's what you, yes, that's what you should agree. do. And, so. and sadly, it doesn't happen. And most of the time, it actually, not most of the time, but um, sometimes it does involve into actually getting up on sexual conversations, which is awful to read. Um, but I do want to point out that we we are not um most of the time the people that we do use are actually around those ages maybe one or two years older um but it's not like fully adults uh the only thing we actually do is we we, we do like look on to those conversations like we have accounts that you know are just there for that uh but it's not as if we're like suddenly you know from a 24 year age man to a 13 year old girl um from the start on it is already you are 13 and the person knows that within the first like 10 messages yeah i think that's a legitimate point not everybody who does the online stings is going to start as a adult yeah. and then lie about their age and transition that's i think that would probably be a minority of the people who actually do that but it would obviously be bad if they did do that that's clearly entrapment but i don't think that right. would be all or the majority of cases no, I, I have seen that we're actually um, 23 year old guys act as 14 year old guy, uh, like boys, uh, as to get closer to a victim uh, or to a person. And um, it's like, I, I, you know, you, if someone says they're 13, even if you're a 14 year old boy or if you're a 23 year old guy, just disengage. Um, but some people will actually fake their age as a 14 year old guy simply to get close to that girl for whatever reason um, i got a super chat from ethernet i agree immoral should be limited in time and commiserate with the penalty crime also contradicts our laws against discrimination in hiring i mean on one hand i do agree with that like hiring shouldn't be affected by that but it should be known uh that the person that you are talking to does have a past with that because if you hide that and you know it happens again you could have like prevented that um if you knew just out of curiosity you, you said it's 2 a.m so you're somewhere over yes, across the pond uh, i'm over in europe yes that's correct so you're you're doing this over on your side not over on this side uh could you explain what you mean by that you're doing it over on the europe side of the atlantic and not the u.s side of the atlantic. we have people that are also u.s based uh i myself have a house in the usa as well larry are they breaking laws by doing this i don't think so uh, but and if they're doing it the way he's describing, I don't have any problem with that. If if they're starting out yeah. as as being minors and and they're people as a, as adults that are hitting on minors, I'm just not experiencing that in in the work that I do. But if that's if that's the case, that that's not a problem for me. No, I, certainly it happens a lot more than than you think as well, and it's uh, it's very sad to see that uh, um, I I wouldn't even let my sister on the internet at this moment in time, at least not. Not on social media, uh, because there are a lot of people that just don't have the right intentions, and you never know what's going to happen. Uh, and I agree that not everything is sexually re related, especially not everyone's an 18-year-old guy that wants to, you know, get close to uh, a girl that's like 13. But, oh, sorry, Ethan, uh, what I'm saying is... Did we ask any questions? Anybody else wanted to ask anything? I commend you for doing it the right way. I, I don't see that on this side of the pond being done the right way. Of course, I guess since I'm in the defense business, I only see the bad cases, but I'm not aware of, of, of the operations in my state or in my region being done the way you're describing. So I appreciate that. Yeah, so I have to go because I have another depending you guys on. You guys can continue to hang out for however long Frank stays and keeps the room open. I will. Thanks again for Andy and Larry for coming on. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to have a conversation. I will see you guys later. I really appreciate being here. Check out our registrymatters.co if you want to the store podcast. You've been listening to FYP.